everyone for coming here and for the and to the organizers for putting together a fantastic meetup. Uh, I am really excited to be at PWL. All right. So today we're going to be talking about multi-phase numerical modeling for jigsaw generation, which is a handful or like a mouthful, and that's not even the full title of the paper, but it was the longest bit of it that we could fit within the meetup like character limit. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if you want to see the slides to follow along or to get the links to the things I reference, they're at bit.ly slash pwl dash puzzles. I also tweeted it out, so if you search for Papers We Love NYC, you'll find it there. All right, I already got introed, but I'll say it again. I'm a software engineer at Twitter uh, and a resistor member. There's definitely not a lot of resistor members in the audience tonight. <laughs> um, you can also find me on the internet as at Brindell or at bionism.com. Um, and I'm interested in lots of things, including programming, but also knitting and natural languages and lasers and generative art. And this talk is going to ta uh, touch specifically on the last two. All right, so let's start by talking about some puzzles. Uh, when I say jigsaw puzzle, you probably think of something that looks like this. So it's something with a very regular shape. Uh, usually they're laid out in this grid pattern and the uh, shape is really iconic, right? You've got very regular cutouts and nodules or whatever you want to call them that lock together. The jigsaw puzzles we're going to look at today are a little bit different. Um, so here's the full paper title, Multiphase Numerical Modeling of Dendritic Solidification for Jigsaw Puzzle Generation. That was a lot. We're going to unpack it a little bit. Um, and the authors, Jesse Rosenberg, Alec Resnick, and Jessica Rosenkrantz, um, two of those three work at Nervous System, which is a place that actually sells this kind of thing. Um, so you can go to nervous.com with hyphens and find both the original paper as well as their stuff. Um, so yeah, the methods that the authors end up using to produce jigsaw puzzles are a pretty strong departure from the grid-based regular shapes that you might commonly associate with jigsaw puzzles. So this is a close-up shot of one of their puzzles. Um, and you can see that like, the shapes are pretty funky, both in terms of the overall puzzle shape as well as the piece boundaries. They've also got something neat going on where they've embedded like uh, images into the puzzle. These are called whimsies. So you've got a microscope, and like I think that's supposed to be a neuron. Um, and so we'll get into how they did all of that. But first, lasers. Um, so these are what make uh, this work possible. Um, so this is actually a photo of that exact puzzle uh, being laser cut. Uh, laser cutters, if you've never used them before, are pretty awesome tools, especially if you're doing prototyping or small batch runs. Um, you give them a vector file, it cuts it out. Uh, they literally install like a printer, like you need printer drivers for your laser, which is pretty fun. Um, and unlike if you use a die cutter, which is how a lot of commercial puzzles get made, um, there's no startup cost, right? You don't have to get a die produced, which means that you can do random one-off puzzles, and that's totally fine. Um, Lasers can handle lots of materials. I added this slide really because I wanted to show a GIF of a laser pie. Um, that was the thing we did for Pi Day a while ago. Um, but lasers are most commonly used with things like wood or acrylic or paper, which makes them a good fit for lasering jigsaw puzzles. Um, if this is something that interests you, come to Resistor, take a class, um, or go to Fat Cat Fab Lab in Manhattan. All right, so lasers, puzzles, what next? Um, so what makes this paper possible is basically the author saying, hey, we've got laser cutters, so we, can, we don't have to do boring standard shapes. We can generate whatever we want, and it's okay. We don't have to make two puzzles that look alike or 100 puzzles that look alike. Um, so what kinds of shapes do we want to make? And so what they end up using is inspired by these things called dendrites, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, but you can see that like, they really took advantage of this by like, each of these shapes is kind of weird, and there's no two shapes that are alike. It's going to be fun. Um, they do a couple different styles, which they talk about in the paper. So here's another style, where you can see that the piece sizes are a lot more irregular, but the piece boundaries are more regular. So the actual edges are all similar to each other compared with these. And they talk about how they grow the different shapes. All right. Lasers, puzzles, something, which we're about to get to, and then profit, i.e., these are all commercial products that we're going to talk about today. All right. Um, these are my own arguments, not the author's arguments. Um, there's a lot that goes into making a good puzzle, right? Like, how much fun is it to put together? Is it confusing, difficult? Um, 
What's the tiling of the pieces like? A grid-based puzzle feels really different from something with hexagonal tiling or something that's spiral-based. Um, the distinctiveness of the piece boundaries matters a lot when you're trying to figure out like, oh, I need a piece that looks like this and I need to slot it in. Um, and you want like the clickiness to be really good so that you're not, you know, that your puzzle's not dif difficult for silly reasons like, um, like a mechanical flaw in how the puzzle was manufactured. You should be able to tell when you put a puzzle piece together correctly. Um, something that I don't care about is the pretty picture on top of the puzzle. Um, so some people, when they put puzzles together, right, you rely on color a lot um, and what shape you're making. To me, that's not one of the more interesting pieces of a puzzle, so that's not something I'm gonna talk about. Um, the meat of this paper talks about uh, piece boundary generation. It talks a lot less about the other factors, um, but keep them in mind when we talk about how the puzzle as a whole comes together. All right, so some things that I like about this one, which I keep showing you. Um, so the pieces here, even though they're weird shapes, they're all of roughly equal size, which for some reason makes the puzzle more satisfying to put together. Um, and even though the shapes are quite challenging because the edges are sort of hard to describe, like how do you say which piece you're looking for, it's actually pretty tractable as a puzzle because you've got this nice clean circular edge and you've got lots of whimsies which give you a good place to start from uh, when you're building it out. All right. So the paper begins by talking about dendrites as a source of inspiration. Um, dendritic solidification being uh, the growth of crystals in a supercooled environment. So some examples. We've got dendrites in zinc. So these things. And then we've got dendrites in ice, so the formation of ice crystals. Um, and we can't see it super clearly here, but there's this really nice branching structure going on. All right, so the authors talk about how they really like the shape of these and how it seems like it could be a good candidate to use for jigsaw generation. And indeed, if we look at uh, a close-up, you can see how that might be an interesting thing to do for your piece boundaries to get some really nice interlocking going. Um, so it looks cool. They'll click together well. Uh, the last bit of this is actually really important, which is that there's a ton of really well-documented modeling techniques for dendritic solidification. Um, it turns out there's lots of practical reasons to study dendrites. Uh, it's useful for metallurgy, biology, immunology. Um, so lots of different applications means that lots of people have studied and then written about how to simulate their growth. Um, so this is an image from a computer-generated model um, that uses a cellular automata-based approach. You can see the YouTube video for the full video if you want. Um, but this is just a snapshot, and you can see how we end up getting some formations that could be useful for our purposes. All right. Um, do we have a question? No. Okay. So this paper uses uh, a phase field model um, as the algorithm for modeling dendritic growth. Uh, lots of people talking about modeling reference this Kobayashi paper, but I couldn't get behind the paywall to read it. Uh, <laughs> very frustrating. Um, Luckily, the authors get pretty detailed in their description of what it is that they're doing and how they're tuning their parameters. Um, but it gets kind of complicated, and I'm more interested in cool squiggles, so we're going to gloss over some of the details. Uh, the gist of the paper is that we're modeling an unstable system, uh, where one portion of it is super cooled. So there's both a temperature shift going on and a phase change, as in between states of matter. Uh, this is where the multi-phase part of the title comes in. Um, so as this is going on, the phase change is releasing and absorbing energy, um, which leads to the boundary growing in weird ways. And that's how we get our squiggles. It's pretty great. Um, it's a rough approximation of how dendritic solidification would work in a real scenario, like with the ice crystals that we saw earlier. Um, it's not the most accurate method, um, but it's useful for graphic applications. We're basically trading precision and accuracy for computable uh, computability. So, like I said, I couldn't get to the Kobayashi paper, but it turns out that there are lots of open source tools for doing this. Um, so you can actually like do modeling on your own, and there's a ton of random GUI tools where you can just say, hey, I want to change like the thermal diffusion coefficient, because why not? Uh, and you end up being able to produce them on your own. Um, so, like I said, there are lots of different reasons why people are interested in these things, um, which means that there's actually quite a few people who use these for graphical applications. So. Lots of stuff available. If you want to play around with that modeling software on your own, it is on the internet. 
Um, so I said earlier that a good puzzle piece boundary should be clicky, right? When you slot it into place, you should be able to tell that it's connected. It shouldn't like drift away if you knock it around on the table. Um, so with the system modeled as is, uh, the authors do successfully start to get these curves. And then if we let it grow a little bit, we'll get more curves. So it starts to look something like this as they run their simulation. So we've definitely got the interlocking, but there is a problem here, which is that one of the phases is growing down into the other, and in the process, we're sort of losing like the substance of the puzzle piece. So this is a great start, but if we were to actually use this as a puzzle, we'd have a lot of like really skinny, awkward pieces that would not be satisfying to put together. Um, it's also kind of hard to tell from here, and I wish they had picked a better screenshot. Um, but you end up getting very asymmetric puzzle pieces because one side is growing into the other. So if you follow that through, you'll end up with very unevenly sized pieces, which again, I don't know exactly why these feel really frustrating to put together, but you want symmetry. Okay. All right, so they change things up. Uh, they make it so that one side is superheated, one side is supercooled. So you end up with uh, both sides growing into each other. And now you have something where you can see, like, if you were to actually cut this off here, that's enough substance for a puzzle piece. Much better. Um, this is my favorite part of the paper. So they take that observation and they say, oh, this is easy. We just need infinite, an infinite number of states of matter. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's definitely the obvious approach. Infinite states of matter. I love it. Um, so. There, if they assign each piece its own phase of matter, uh, every piece will be superheated and supercooled relative to the ones that are next to it. Um, this is the point at which I'm just trusting the authors when they say that they uh, update their equations to handle infinite states of matter. Sure, yeah, we believe you. Um, now, infinity is kind of a lot. It would be nice if we could model fewer things than infinity. Um, so what they do is they use the five color theorem and turn this into a graph coloring issue. So puzzle pieces, right, are next to each other. That's sort of the point of a puzzle. Um, we can use graph coloring to make sure that no two pieces with the same uh, phase of matter are next to each other. Um, we could do four coloring, right, like four colors would be enough to color that. But if we do it with five, it's computationally way more tractable and we don't really mind the difference between five and four. Um, all right, so the way that they do this is actually really, really simple. They, they describe it as sort of a like simulated annealing depth first search thing, but all that they're doing is coloring a piece, coloring the next piece, backing off if they end up with two things that look the same color, and then if they keep backing up and things just aren't working, they start again. <laughs> um, this is not the expensive part of the simulation, so it doesn't matter that their approach to graph coloring is really simple. I really like that they included it in the paper. Um, I think it's a very good and very honest method of saying, we didn't need to optimize this. Premature optimization is silly. We just used five colors and tried it out till it worked. All right, so now we've got some squiggles uh, that we're making by growing dendrites. Um, how do we make a puzzle, right? Like, okay, we've got some boundaries, but what next? All right, so um, there's a lot more that goes into making a line into a full puzzle. So we're gonna start here, and we're gonna end up here. The part we just talked about is th these three things at the bottom, right? We start out with some lumpy puzzle shapes, and then we pretend that they're dendrites, and we grow them, and we grow them some more, and we grow them even more. So let's jump back to the beginning. So uh, remember, I said that there were some things that made a good puzzle. We're gonna get into stuff that affects the tiling of the pieces next. All right, the authors devote very little actual time in the paper to this, which I think is really interesting because this drives like the majority of the aesthetics of the puzzle, um, at least like from my perspective. Um, and there's two bits to that. One is how do you place your seeds and the next one we're about to get to. But so seed placement, uh, they call this dart throwing, which is a really fancy way of saying, eh, we generated some blue noise. Um, so uh, they, randomly generate a point. If that point is not more than this, uh, this P distance of an existing seed, they keep it. And they keep going until they have the number of puzzle pieces that they wanted. Seems reasonable, it works. 
they make a brief note that you can generate them in other ways, but they don't really show you the different ways that that impacts your puzzle. It has a huge impact. We'll get to that in a minute. All right, so now you've got some points. How do you turn that into pieces? Yeah, they just say, oh, you just jump from this to this. It's great. Um, you know, draw a circle, draw the owl. So now that we have our seeds, um, we get the polygons by using something called uh, Voronoi's method, or Voronoi, I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, it's a really cool way of generating polygons from points, um, and we call this diagram a Voronoi diagram. The algorithm is called Fortune's algorithm. There are many algorithms for getting uh, from points to polygons. But so the definition of each polygon is that for, yeah, like right here, uh, for any of these points inside, they're closer to this seed point than to any of the other seed points, which seems like a reasonable way to divide this up. Um, you'll see a lot of different generative art projects using exactly this um, when they need to seed some random stuff because it's a whole lot easier to generate uh, random points in a space than it is to generate random polygons filling a space. All right, uh, so we have an algorithm for generating our seeds. It gives us blue noise generation with dart throwing plus the Voronoi diagrams to actually give us polygons. Um, and when you like look at the kind of, like this polygon layout, you can already see the aesthetics of your puzzle taking shape, right? Like this has a big impact on it. So I would have liked to see more experimentation with that. Um, but luckily we can do that for ourselves. All right, next up is this step. Uh, they call it edge perturbation. So they take two sine waves and they just add them to every side of the polygon. Um, one of the sine waves is way bigger than the other. All right. We go from here to here. <laughs> um, I thought that it, there's like one paragraph on this. Uh, I thought this was really funny because, you know, we just discussed all of this really complex math, the modeling infinite states of matter in order to get some, like, very good biological simulations. And then, like, oh, by the way, we, we just added some sine waves because the sine waves make it better. Um, again, things I appreciate about this paper, honest methods. <laughs> uh, if you look, right, these pieces are again starting to look like the kinds of vaguely random but still organic looking thing that we want our puzzle pieces to look like. Um, so when you need to initialize your starting conditions, the sine wave perturbation is actually, I think, a really clever and still very simple, very tractable way of getting these really neat shapes, um, even if I do have a little bit of that reaction. Um, adding noise and jitter can give you much, much better results and it takes a lot of experimentation to figure out what will give you a really satisfying conclusion. All right, so dart throwing, blue noise, Voronoi diagrams, sine waves, and then a ton of dendrite simulation, this being the time intensive part of the work. Yeah. Um, does the polygon generation function uh, take the number of sides as a? Uh, no. Is it random? So the question was, does the polygon generation function take the number of sides? Instead, it, what a Voronoi diagram does is it uses um, this definition, which says that every point inside a polygon must be closer to the seed than to any other seed. So depending on how your points are laid out, you might get something where everything is a square, or you might get something where every polygon has like 13 sides. Um, it depends entirely on the distribution of points. Does the... Puzzles are three-dimensional or multi-dimensional or just two-dimensional? Um, so these puzzles are two-dimensional. Um, I don't know if you can do 3D Voronoi diagrams, but that would be fun to try. I assume you can. You must, yeah. It, it seems like it should uh, scale arbitrarily. It's just distances from points. So. Yep. <laughs> okay, yeah, I assume that it's very, very possible and that people have probably done cool things with it. We have another comment or question. These kinds of comments I like. So yeah, Verna diagrams exist in all dimensions and get increasingly quickly more difficult to compute as you climb. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that question has been answered. Awesome. Any more questions about that? Yeah. 
So the, the perturbation phase you have there, is that just to speed up the whole simulation process or is that a necessary part of the, uh, the whole process? Uh, it's not to speed up the process. It's actually unrelated to the dendritic growth modeling. Um, it happens to match with it visually very well. And I think the goal of it is actually, they don't really discuss the motivation in the paper, but from what I've found when I was experimenting with it on my own, um, if you just use the polygons as is, you end up in this problem of edge collision around here. And you can't grow your dendrites that far before they just all start colliding into each other at this kind of intersection point. Whereas if you do this perturbation, you actually avoid a lot of that and you can get more interesting simulations. Uh, Max and then Trammell. <laughs> we don't know each other at all. Um, so when do you know uh, when you're done growing dendrites? Uh, so they show several snapshots um, as the simulation progresses and basically you stop growing dendrites when it would become, uh, the dendrites would be too thin to produce like uh, structurally sound puzzle pieces. So you experiment. Do they apply Lloyd's algorithm or any other relaxation on the uh, polygons before going to this step? That uh, I found that makes a much more balanced, uh, it eliminates a lot of those, those tiny edges and, and things. Can you tell us what Lloyd's algorithm is? It's a relaxation step that involves <laughs> Uh, moving the points uh, to give a better distribution. If you just do a random distribution, you end up with lots of small, tiny little edges. Uh, there's, there's a really good uh, uh, D3JS demo of it. Cool. I would love to hear more about that later. Um, I do not believe the authors do that, although don't quote me on that one. Oh, wait, we're on camera. <laughs> one more? Uh, wait, let's get the mic. Awesome. So are you, are you saying that if you have the small, tight spaces, you have a lot more density of uh, squiggly lines? Or is that what you saw from your simulation? Um, yeah. So actually, you can kind of see it in here, right, where you end up, if you let it keep growing, it ends up being really, really dense. And what you don't want is to have two thin pieces, because then, depending on your material, they can snap off if you handle them roughly. All right, cool. All right. <laughs> so we made some puzzles. Or rather, the authors made some puzzles that are pretty cool. Um, and you know, it's, uh, it's, it's not like they had any sort of complicated steps or anything like that. There's definitely not a lot of math in here. Um, I think it's pretty neat that they took all of these disparate steps and then, you know, sum together you get a pretty good puzzle. Um, and also, it's not obvious at all that any of these things should really play well together, uh, except for maybe like the dart throwing and then the Voronoi polygons. Um, so this, even though they don't discuss a whole lot their experimentation process, you can tell that they've iterated a lot of times on trying to find the combination of simulations that would give them the kind of effect that they want. Um, so that's pretty great. All right, I'm going to take us on a brief side trip to the Recurse Center. So uh, earlier this year, I did a week-long stint at RC working on jigsaw puzzle generation uh, and mostly inspired by this paper, which is why I wanted to talk about it today. Um, so RC, or Recurse Center, is a self-directed and community-driven educational retreat uh, for people who want to get better at programming. There's no curriculum, there's no prompting, it is not a boot camp, um, it's just very open-ended. Uh, usually people are there for six to 12 weeks, but I was part of an experimental one-week mini-batch, um, which meant I had five days, and in five days I decided I wanted to learn a new programming language, closure, and generate puzzles. Sounds fine, sounds good. Um, and so because I was basing it on this paper, I wanna show you a little bit of some of the stuff I found and some of the experiments that we did. Um, because I was learning a new programming language, uh, for starters, I was generating very, very basic tiled puzzles uh, using traditional shapes. So this is very boring. This is day one. Day two is me trying to learn how to generate Voronoi diagrams. <laughs> uh, pro tip, 
Uh, be really careful about confusing your x and y coordinates. It definitely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's better. <laughs> uh, so this is an example of the kinds of polygons you get from something that's mostly a plain grid, but with like five pixels of jitter, right? Five pixels is enough to go from getting like super regular things to now we have, you know, lumpy polygons with different shapes and sizes. So that was cool. Um, this is the same Verona diagram, but with each polygon line replaced with a puzzle piece line. Um, it's the same exact line on all of them, just scaled and uh, transformed properly. So starting to look like a puzzle, okay. I'm not using any methods from the paper yet except for just um, seeding and then diagram generation. Um, and because I only had five days and didn't want to learn a proper graphics library enclosure, I decided that the obvious thing to do was to just generate SVG strings. <laughs> Uh, SVGs are conveniently interpretable by uh, the laser cutter. So, uh, F SVG, if you haven't worked with it before, is an XML-ish format. Maybe it's valid XML, I don't know. Um, <coughs> the real magic happens when you define how a path should look. It lets you draw Bezier curves pretty easily, as well as transform them. Uh, you could instruct it to, you know, uh, translate them in space or rotate them or things like that, uh, which makes it convenient for doing this kind of stuff. Well, mildly convenient. Um, so, I added in some curves. Uh, this is what happens when you use their dart throwing technique along with Verona diagrams, along with like some pretty random Bezier curve generation. Uh, so that was fun. Um, once you add in some decent curves on the edges, you start to actually get something that looks interesting. So that's cool. Um, this is an example with spiral seed placement. So um, again, you don't have to use blue noise for where you want your edges to be. This starts by generating things densely here and then circling outward in concentric circles. Um, and so you end up with a much more like round puzzle. All right, um, quick break. Let's talk about whimsies. So whimsy is actually a piece of like technical jigsaw puzzling jargon, which I really love. Um, and I, I wanted to have some good references to quote for on like jigsaw puzzle technicalities, but someone has checked all of the jigsaw history books out of the New York Public Library. <laughs> I don't know who this person is, but I want to befriend them. <laughs> um, all right, so Liberty Puzzles and Wentworth are two manufacturers who still do a lot of uh, wooden carved puzzles with custom designs and with whimsies in them. Um, so a whimsy is sort of like this, this maker's mark of, you know, how creative can you get with including themed, specially shaped pieces inside of your puzzles. Um, I really like this Mother's Day puzzle example where not only do you have the happy Mother's Day letters, but you also have lily shaped pieces inside of your lily puzzle, which is kind of cute. Um, they're usually themed, they're just sort of a way to show off and add some more flourish. Um, the nervous system paper does include whimsy piece generation, uh, but all that they say is treat a whimsy as a boundary condition. The rest is left as an exercise to the reader. Um, so I tried my hand at it, and this was probably the most fun piece of it all. Um, so the way, yes. I just have a quick question. What's going actually on this slide? Um, oh, no, the next slide. What's on the? What's going on with the edges? I, it looks like some of like double. Like on that top corner, there's like an extremely narrow piece. Here? Uh, no, the, uh, ab above it. Like there, yeah. What, what's going on up there? Where there's edges overlap? Yeah. Um, that is what we call a bug. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so what this is doing is because of these seeds outside of the puzzle boundary, Whenever I would generate um, my Verona diagrams and then I would add in the, the boundary curves, I'd get these and they're kind of frustrating and hard to remove algorithmically or at least I couldn't figure out a way. But the nice thing with the laser cutter is it just means you'll have more scrap on the outside of your puzzle. <laughs> um, so sometimes I would go in and manually delete them and sometimes I would just let the laser, you know, waste a little bit extra of wood or acrylic. But yeah, that's something I should fix, me too. Any more questions? Cool. Um, so 
Whimsy generation. I decided that I would do this thing where I would add a seed point to the Voronoi diagram representing um, where the whimsy should go. And then I would delete any other seeds within a certain radius of it. Um, so I would clear space for it. And this gives us a place to put the whimsy. Uh, but we don't just want it to be floating in space. That's kind of weird, right? Like, then you just end up with this silhouetted puzzle piece that doesn't really fit. Um, oh, so what we have to do is find the nearest points to this one and connect them back with the funky shape that we want to add to the middle. Luckily, finding nearest points to something is a very well-solved problem, so I just used a KD tree because, you know, that works. KD trees let you uh, really quickly find nearest neighbors. Again, almost certainly more sophisticated approaches I could have taken. Didn't really need to take a more sophisticated approach. All right, so here's a cat whimsy. Um, you can see that I've defined these five anchor points on the cat, um, and then I have found the nearest neighboring puzzle pieces, and then just drawn connections between them. And that seems to work decently well. Um, this does require you to manually figure out where those anchor points should be, and that's something that I'd like to make, uh, you know, do algorithmically in the future. But luckily, it only takes about five minutes in Inkscape. So that's fine. Uh, next up is lasering, because lasers are great. Uh, it takes about 15 minutes to cut one copy of this kind of puzzle. So not too bad. And then we put it together. Um, good testimonials I heard from people putting this puzzle together. Whoever made this is evil. <laughs> Whoever made this should feel bad about themselves. <laughs> this puzzle is great. I love it. This puzzle is awful. I hate it. Um, and I think the best testimonial was that I just left it on a table and walked away uh, and then came back hours later and people were still putting it together. Um, <laughs> It only took, it actually took about three hours for us to, to solve the puzzle. Um, if you want more code uh, or more images from this or the actual code, they're both online, bonnieisman.com. There's a link to it. Um, this is literally the first closure code I've ever written. So, you know, don't expect it to be pretty. Um, but I had a lot of fun trying to imitate uh, the work from the paper. Uh, I thought it was really rewarding and fun to play with. Um, I had a lot of stuff to experiment with, and I learned some math. Uh, it's sort of a running joke among the software engineers I know that like we never use algorithms in our day job. Um, but if you're doing generative art, uh, that comes up quite a lot, right? So my very, very naive implementation does use Voronoi diagrams and KD trees, and I had to actually stand up at a whiteboard and like diagram out trigonometry, which I hadn't done in ages. Um, and that was all quite fun. Uh, and I didn't even get into any of the complexities around how to model really cool piece boundary techniques. So uh, that was great. In the original paper, a lot of the work that they're able to do, they can only do because they have this really good understanding of how their modeling uh, works, um, like the fact that you have to tile infinite states of matter, um, or that graph coloring can solve that problem for you. So that was pretty neat. Um, there's a lot of stuff left that I want to experiment with, uh, mostly around like how to deal with piece collision, how to deal with different seed distributions, whatever it was that Trammell mentioned that I'm going to go fester him about later with relaxation. So that will be fun. Um, and FYI, the paper that I presented on today is about six years old. Uh, and the authors have not stopped making things since then, so they've gotten a lot crazier. This is some of their more recent work, which they call a maze puzzle, which is based on simulations of uh, rod growth. They started out trying to make this a 3D puzzle, and then I think uh, ended up realizing that the 2D result was pretty cool. They also have a infinity puzzle, which is modeled on a torus that's been sliced open so that there's no edge pieces, in case you wanted your puzzles to be even harder to do. So that's cool. Um, oh, and one last thing. Um, this is not a puzzle. But this is a piece of inspiration that I couldn't resist including. This is not a puzzle. It is, in fact, uh, an image of the epidermal cells from a leaf of this plant. Uh, so this is a paper that was published in February of this year. Um, and it turns out that many species of plants actually have jigsaw puzzle-shaped leaf cells. So the paper title is Why Plants Make Puzzle Cells and How Their Shape Emerges. Um, and the researchers simulated the growth of these cells uh, and figured out that in surfaces with isotropic growth, so growing evenly in all directions, which you see in leaves rather than roots or stems, um, 
puzzle-like shapes that look like this are actually how you maximize gr cell growth while minimizing structural stress. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, if you like the intersection between natural systems and generative art, um, there are more, ac there's more academic work and work by artists than I could possibly go into, but I've received several recommendations for this series. Um, I am personally working my way through the algorithmic beauty of plants right now, and, and, and I am enjoying it a lot. All right, that's all I've got. Thank you so much. You can find me on the internet or here. Thank you. We've got time for more questions, if there's more. I see one here. So you mentioned you were learning closure at the same time as implementing and figuring out the details of this paper. Did you have any concerns about like doing so much stuff at once? And if so, how did you manage that? And how do you think it went? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So the paper was sort of my stretch goal, right? And you can see that there's a ton of work in the paper that I didn't even get to touch. Um, I wanted to do something with closure that would just involve me working with strings because it seemed like a reasonably interesting problem that I would not be bored of. But usually you figure out how to print a string on your first day of working with a new language, uh, which is why the original puzzles that I showed are just, hey, look, I drew a single puzzle piece. Yeah, so I'm actually surprised at how well my plan worked out. Um, I was also not wedded to the idea of following the plan and honestly expected to fail. Uh, to what ex the 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 paper talks about the like the dendrite formation stuff in sort of metallurgical terms. To what extent is that like metaphorical versus like actual metal physics? Uh, my understanding is that it's literal. Um, what is the what is the what is the effect of adding boundary conditions to uh, the Voronoi Voronoi mm -hmm. Voronoi uh, uh, polygon generator? If what I specify is, shape, like mm -hmm. if I want it to be square or um, yeah, so it'll deform the kinds of polygons that you grow. Um, I don't know of any general work around like describing it because I'm not sure how I would generalize it. Um, but it'll change the shape of everything that you get out. So the paper has a relatively complicated mathematical formulation which results in some kind of puzzle, and it sounds like you did something much simpler, and you also have an interesting puzzle. To what extent can you make something as interesting or as fun, like as you define, however you define like a fun puzzle without doing something so complicated? Um, yeah, that's one of the ironies that I actually really, really enjoy about the paper. Um, I think that there are, is a lot of fun stuff you can do without getting so complicated, but equally there's certain kinds of interesting stuff that you can only do if you're willing to get complicated. Um, like I think that they draw very explicitly on certain kinds of biological systems in their work, um, and they wouldn't be able to evoke the same kinds of reactions if they were not willing to dig into that complexity. But I personally, for my own projects, am content uh, to not go there. Um, could you talk about how your uh, edge per perturbations, like how you did those quickly, how do they actually differ from the ones that are in the paper? Because I understand they're like the simpler version. Um, so the, I don't do any sine wave perturbation. Um, that's probably the biggest difference. And my implementation, you can look at it on GitHub, it's pretty naive. Um, I basically say like, found a equation for a Bezier curve that looked like I wanted, and then I move a certain amount of pixels in from the edges, and then I add between three and five of them. So, very naive. Were there any good failures of things you printed and the pieces broke? Um, so actually, this one has a very good failure that I like. Uh, where is it? Um, I really, there's a piece that is so small that I, ah, this piece, this tiny flag. I didn't realize until I printed it that I had made a piece that was about the size of my pinky nail. Uh, as you can imagine, that piece kept getting lost. <laughs> Although we did eventually find it and put together the completed puzzle. 
Um, when you have the whimsies in there, you can kind of notice the pieces around there are a much different shape, almost like they're centered around that whimsy. Yep. Um, is that something that we see in the, uh, the work that they did in the paper, or do they not show any completed examples with whimsies? Uh, I am backing up to the example that does show it. Yeah. So if you look in the top half of this paper, these shapes are all really different. And I don't actually think that it's because, I don't know if they did this intentionally or not, um, but you can even see it like in these ones, right, where you have this ongoing effect from where you placed your whimsies. So you have to be really careful with the placement so that they balance each other out. That's something that I really want to explore more because it's pretty fun. Uh, did you see anything about the relationships between uh, Fourneau diagrams and Delaunay triangulation? Uh, can you say that last bit again? Uh, did you see anything about uh, the connections between Voronoi diagrams and Delaunay triangulations? Um, I saw a few references to that, but I don't actually know anything about the latter. So I would love to talk more about it. Cool. Yeah. Uh, do you have any metrics around <laughs> difficulty? And is there a way to parameterize <laughs> difficulty to tune up or down the, your puzzles? Bill are, Bill, are you volunteering to be my test subject? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so there, there's one person in the audience here who is fond of making maximally difficult puzzles and then dropping them in front of my desk. Um, so we should probably consult with that individual. What's the, what's the puzzle in the last slide printed on? Uh, the puzzle in the last slide is printed, oh, I'm sorry for how much jitter this is causing. Uh, there we go. The puzzle in the last slide is printed on 16th inch white acrylic, uh, which I purchased from Canal Plastics. <laughs> yeah, uh, I found that 16th inch acrylic was perfectly thick enough um, for like one out of 16. Um, was perfectly thick enough to have a satisfying puzzle piece. Um, conveniently, the thinner you go, the faster it is to cut. So that also worked out well. All right, any more questions or should we wrap it up? Okay, thank you.